Thank you, choir. We appreciate that very much. It's because many of God's people down through the ages have pledged allegiance to the Lamb that you and I have the inscripturated Word of God in our hands this morning. And it's also the reason why we can uh, very publicly assemble together like this. We have an awful lot to be thankful for, not only because of God and His grace and mercy to us, but because of God's people that have stood. Thank you again for that ministry. Uh, please be in prayer for Carl Briggs. He's actually doing better, but he's uh, been in a difficult spot and has been in the hospital down in Florida, uh, suffering with congestive heart failure. He is making progress, so much so that they anticipate his uh, soon release from the hospital, but we certainly want to continue to be in prayer for him. We continue to pray for the beloved Reinault family, Beulah and Patty in particular, and then the rest of the family as they continue to come to grips with Bill's home going. We rejoice over his home going, but we understand and experience the loss uh, of, of uh, our temporarily saying goodbye to him. So please keep the family in prayer. Uh, we're excited to be together today, and we know that God has a, a great uh, word and great work for us in our hearts, and we're looking forward to all that. Take your Bibles, please. We're turn turning to Genesis chapter 1. We're reading verses 20 through 23, Genesis chapter 1, beginning with verse 20, and reading through the 23rd verse. As you find it, I'll invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Thank you. you may be seated for our time of prayer. Father, again, we've assembled through these gates with thanksgiving in our hearts. We thank you, God, for your grace and mercy in our lives that's new and fresh every day. And we thank you especially for your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we've been prompted through our choir's ministry to remember and recognize and stand in awe of the fact that God's people down through the ages have pledged allegiance to the Lamb. And for many, it's cost them their very lives. And yet, we are the happy recipients of the products of such commitment and conviction on the part of your people. For we hold in our hands the inscripturated word of God. And from a human standpoint, we wouldn't have it apart from faithful men and women transmitting such again down through the ages. Lord, I pray that that will stir our hearts again this morning and that it will do its part in prepping our hearts for the reception of your word and your truth. May we leave here a changed people because of that. No, God, we find uh, in, in the word of God the blessed gospel, and oh, how we desire to share that with those who still need the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I pray that you'd be doing that all-important work in the hearts and lives of those who have not yet put personal faith and trust in the one and only Savior from sin. And God, we thank you for the way that you continue to meet our needs, and really every day we experience you as our faithful and great high priest who is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. We continue to pray for the Rhino family and Beulah and Patty in particular and ask that they'd be the recipients of that peace that passes all understanding. We continue to pray for Brother Carl Briggs and ask, Lord, that your healing hand would be upon him. Uh, the prospect of his uh, being released from the hospital is, is, a, is an exciting one, and we thank you for that. God, we've uh, come ultimately to fix our eyes on the author and finish of our faith and to worship the one creator, God, and Savior. So I pray that you'd help us with that all-important endeavor, and we desire for every aspect of the service, including our giving, to be a part of our worship of our great God. So be pleased with us right on through, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.
Thank you, ladies, for that beautiful song. God so loved the world. Aren't you glad he did? Glad he does. Let's stand and sing one verse. So the children, you're, you can go out right now. Choir's going to go out, so don't crash into each other. Children, uh, for the children's church, we're singing one verse of 347. All creatures of our God and King. 347, verse 1 only. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and sing and sing. Alleluia, alleluia. The burning sun with golden gleam, the silver moon with soft blue gleam. Oh, praise Him. Oh,
Thank you, ladies, Hannah and Katie. We appreciate that. A beautiful song reflecting on our great God and uh, certainly an appropriate prayer as we get ready to open up the pages of God's book that part of our heart cry would be that we would allow God to still us so that we can see him and see his truth clearly aided by the Spirit of God. Heavenly Father, thank you for the ministry of music and thank you for all of our uh, special and beloved people that uh, you have uh, gifted in that realm and thank you for their faithfulness in ministering to us Lord and uh, it, it's an effectual ministry we are so quickly whisked away to appropriate places through the wonderful medium of music and oftentimes we uh, find ourselves at the foot of the cross and we're reminded of your great love that is expressed in a pinnacled way there. And other times we really fall to our knees in worship of our great God. And uh, then along with uh, all of that, uh, our appropriate prayers, uh, so many of our songs are appropriate prayers, and certainly this one this morning, that we would be still and listen to you, Lord. So that's our prayer. Help us as we listen, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our study in Genesis continues. We come this morning to verses 20 through 23 of chapter 1 and God's activities on day 5 of the creation week. Such activity revolving around God's creation of the fish and the fowl, that is, marine and flying animals. Folks, it is getting good. Actually, it's been good, as you know, right from the get-go. It's been miraculous, and it has been spectacular. And you and I have stood in awe and wonder before the great creator God right from the very first verse of the very first chapter of this very first book. But now God creates living creatures, including the fish and the fowl. God is about to put his finger on creatures that he dubs has life in them, and so the phrase living creatures will become very significant to us today and right on through. I remind you, especially those of you that have been with us, that up until day five, God has been getting the earth ready for living creatures. It's been a joy to watch the activity on the part of God. We, we have and will continue to emphasize just how special this earth is. And we have had the privilege of watching God as he creates ex nihilo and then as he makes and as he fashions and he's done an awful lot of that and all of it has been in preparation for living creatures including the food that living creatures would need in order to support and sustain life namely the plants, which you will recall God caused to sprout in a spectacular way back on day three. Man, do we have some interesting and exciting things here in our text. Take a look. Genesis 1 and verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. There are two words in this phrase that I just read that in regard to the Bible are never applied to plants. We 
We've talked about plants. We were triggered and prompted to do so back on, on day three. And I told you back then because we said some things that were uh, certainly interesting, but perhaps even a little bit surprising that we would have opportunity for clarification as we go. You and I were taken back a little bit back on day three, our study of day three. And uh, the reason why we were is because we discovered together that plants, by way of biblical definition, are not alive. Now, what we're hovering over here again this morning certainly falls in the realm of semantics. But please note with me that this is God's semantics. And so if it's God's semantics, then you and I need to have a handle on it. There certainly is a sense, please note this well with me this morning, in regard to plants, there certainly is a sense in which plants are alive. Again, we've stood in awe of this. Plants have uh, their own unique DNA. Plants uh, have amazing, we would say, miraculous, miraculous processes that unfold inside them, including photosynthesis. Plants are uh, a complex creation and certainly masterfully designed plants grow and even reproduce and so in light of those things we could legitimately say that plants are alive I have thought about our young people and even our children that would go to school and say, hey, I went to church and I found out that plants are not alive and I have a feeling that that would stir things up a little bit in the school system, especially among the science teachers. There is a sense in which plants are alive and that sense relates to what I've just expressed to you. But the fact of the matter is, again, semantics, not ours but God's, and words in particular, not ours but God's. From a purely biblical definition, the fact of the matter is plants are not alive. And we even express some of the reasons why that's a pretty important truth. From a biblical standpoint and by biblical definition, plants are not alive. And in the biblical text, there are five different Hebrew terms that designate life. And what I need to express to you quickly, although we're going to discourse it a little bit, is that not one of these five terms at any time are applied to plants. Thus, our strong but accurate statement that plants, by way of biblical definition, are not alive. Two of the five terms we find here in verse 20. That's why we're talking about this again today. And again, clarification, we prepped you for that. Two of the five terms we find here right in verse 20. And the phrase, the moving creature that hath life. This is not only instructive, but it's outright fun. Come and have some fun with me. Ha. Ah, smile for the very first time this morning. And all I had to say is, come and have some fun with me. I'm going to have to remember that. Would you write that down for me, Pastor Landon? Come and have some fun with me. There are five Hebrew terms that designate life. And again, and I, am, I, I realize I'm belaboring, there are five Hebrew, ter five Hebrew terms that designate life, and not a one of them are ever applied or ascribed to plants. Two of them are right here, and again, the phrase, the moving creature that hath life. The first word that designates life that is never applied to plants is the word moving. And we're a little, you know, again, that's a, a little bit surprising to us, probably from a couple of different standpoints, but especially we would read right over that word moving, and we would be th thinking that it probably doesn't have very much significance, but it does because plants don't move. Huh. Now, I know you guys are good thinkers, you know, and that's good, by the way. You certainly keep me on my toes. When we talk about plants not moving, we're speaking specifically of the idea of self-directed. Listen to the terms, and again, nothing complicated here per se, or you wouldn't be getting it through me, but 
but, but you do need a few minutes to think through terms and to contemplate these things, and I certainly understand that. When you talk about the fact that plants don't move, we're talking about movement that relates to self-directed and independent movement. Now, plants can be and are caused to move. In fact, when you go to the nursery and you buy a plant, you move it from the nursery to your garden and you plant it. So even you are the culprit in, in you know, some plant movement. But again, that's not self-directed and independent movement on the part of the plant. And such is the case even with the sun. One of the things we learned early on, which was kind of neat in regard to the power of the sun, is that plants, most plants at least, tend to move toward the sun. But again, they are caused to move by the sun. And I'll tell you this, this was kind of neat, and you guys may know more about it than me, but we did, than I do, but we did a little bit of research. Take, for instance, like the, the Venus flytrap. How many have ever owned a Venus flytrap plant? Yeah, so you know about that. I, I'll, I'll tell you what the Venus flytrap plant isn't doing and thinking. By the way, he has these two big leaves that he opens up, and and, uh, and, and then we watch again and wonder, again, the master designer. We watch and wonder as, at the appropriate time, uh, the, the plant closes those big leaves. And you know the reason why he does is because he's now got his meal. And you can hear the terminology that I'm using, even some of the personal pronouns, you know, about a Venus flytrap, so much so that you'd be thinking that, man, not only does the Venus, not only is the Venus flytrap alive, but, but he, she's got a personality, you know. I'll tell you what's not happening with the Venus flytrap. He's not sitting there like this and, oh, 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 there's a fly. Whoa, he better not get very close to me. If he comes pretty close to me, I'm going to whack. I'll get him. I'll have my meal. I'll tell you, that's not what's happening. <laughs> and of course, that's good, because he would die of a heart attack every time he went through that. <laughs> but rather, the leaves are open, and inside the leaf, leaves, oh, oh, masterful design. Tiny little hairs. And if you don't, I, I know you do appreciate God. And his masterfulness. And I know you do appreciate the design of creation. And I know that you are joining me in going even further in our understanding of such blessed things. But these little hairs are inside these leaves. And when an insect comes and touches those tiny hairs, then this amazingly designed trapping mechanism is triggered. And by the way, to see the intricacy of God's design, when the insect touches just one hair, no trigger. But as the insect touch, touches one hair, and while continuing to touch that hair, touches another, then whoop. And by the way, the significance of that, God, in his creation of even things that by way of biblical definition are not alive, even in circumstances like that, God's design is such so that there's not even the waste of energy. Absolutely amazing. But here's the thing. Venus fly trap plants respond to external stimuli. It's actually the fly that triggers this amazingly designed trapping mechanism. Plants don't move. And so by way of biblical definition, they're not alive. The, the second word here, which is never applied to plants, it's interesting we have to state it in the negative like that. Five Hebrew terms, two of them here. The first is moving. Never applied to plants. 
Plants don't move. The second word here is ne that's never applied to plants is the word life. And what you'll be interested about this, you, you won't be surprised if I say that there's actually a number of Hebrew terms that stand behind our English word life. And again, each one with their own distinction and shade of meaning. What's interesting about the word life here in verse 20 is that this is the word for life in regard to the human language that is used most basically. In, in other words, this is the primary, broad, inclusive Hebrew word for life. In other words, if something's alive, you can count on this particular word being used of it. It's the Hebrew word ka'i, never used of plants. By the way, and since I have you that far, we ought to complete our thought, although, again, we'll continue to seek a clarification even as our study unfolds. But I, I, I keep mentioning to you these five Hebrew terms, and two of them here, in verse 20, and so we've talked about them because uh, verse 20 prompts us to do it. But let's complete the thought, the three other terms. The, the first is the Hebrew word nefesh. If you have ever done any word studies in the Hebrew language, then you've undoubtedly come across the term. Again, it's uh, often used in Old Testament scriptures. It's sometimes actually often translated as soul. It speaks of the self-awareness of something, and it speaks of the feeling of the thing. In other words, this is the emotive part, emotions. This is the emotive part of life, and that word is never used of plants. So sorry, even when you and I with our green thumbs or whatever other color you might have or not have, watch our plants, we make, we, we misstate it when we say, my plant is looking pretty sad. Now, it may be in the process of dying, but it's not sad. That's the Hebrew word nefesh, never applied to plants, and the Second, or the fourth word, however you're counting, is the Hebrew word ruach. It's often translated spirit. And, and that particular term emphasizes the mental consciousness of the thing. It includes, because believe it or not, when we get to the animals, which will be there very quick, I mean land animals, you'll be surprised how many of these terms are actually applicable, used of land animals. And so the term here is an emphasis on the being's mental consciousness, including like intuition and instinct. Never used of plants. And then the fifth and final one, or the third, depending on how you're counting, is the, word, the Hebrew word dom. It is the primary Hebrew word for blood. It is never used of plants. So there is the biblical warrant for us, recognizing that by way of biblical definition, that plants are not alive. And so animals, again, could consume them, perhaps even the entire plant, and do so before the fall, and there be no conflict with what we know to be true, and that is that sin and death did not enter this world until the fall of man. So I trust that that brings you a little bit of uh, clarification, if, and if not, then just continue to walk with us. We will have other opportunities. Now we need to re-engage our, our, our text. All of that, by the way, that wasn't a rabbit trail. It wasn't. All of that is spurred by verse 20. And, and as I can tell now, the way you're handling this thing, we're going to need more than one session here. I think, you know, because we're not even halfway through verse 20. 
but, but we're, we're coming. And I, I'm referencing verse 20 again. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. By the way, you know, I could spend all of our time and a whole lot more just telling you bird stories, and so too you and me, and there would even be value in that. We're back to our beloved uh, Mel Matthews, who had the capacity to make us cry over a partridge that's on his porch. For good grief, I, I can't believe it. Very effective stories that bring honor and glory to God. Let's just stay here for the course of a week with nothing but potty breaks and tell stories, real narratives of God's wonderful creation and the amazing design. And the way in which, as you know, God often uses his creation to teach us lessons that pertain to life and living. What a great, great God. So, I mean, we could spend a lot of time here and go really no further in talking about birds. And, and one of the things, and I probably would do this a little bit as we go, but again, we could spend entire sessions just focusing in on a, ki on a particular kind of bird and the amazing way in which they bespeak the fact that they are in existence by divine fiat and only by the powerful proclamation of the all-powerful creator God. I, I, I've talked to you about chickens before. You know, I've become a chicken farmer. Man, we could spend... A couple of sessions just talking about chickens and talking about the egg and then saying, wow, what an amazing God. And every time we look at something that God has created, we take great, great strides away from evolution, not toward it, away from evolution. Man. So again, we could spend a lot of time here. Day five, the creation of fish, marine animals, and the creation of birds or fowl, flying animals. But something very interesting about the wording here in verse 20, and I've especially been looking forward to this. And by the way, it's a correction not of your misconception, but mine. The wording of verse 20 here is very interesting, and it allows for something that you and I may not actually be conscious of. And I've even figured out, even though you don't know what I'm talking about, you shortly will, I, I, I think that I've even figured out why we are sporting this misconception. I believe that it's the result of some assumption on our part and also some extrapolation. And here it is, we picture God here creating only two of every kind. And I think that the reason why we think that, again, a combination of assumption and extrapolation, I, I think the reason why I have thought that in the past is because one I know tomorrow, that is day six, that God is going to create not only the animals, which he'll create them in the very same way in which he creates the birds and the fish here, and you'll understand that in just a second as well. But tomorrow, day six, God is going to create man and woman, a single pair, one man, one woman. And so as we come to grips with that, and rightfully so, and by the way, we will be reveling in that. And, and it will absolutely, at least potentially, transform our lives. But because we have that envisioned in our heart and mind, and rightfully so, we, we, we extrapolate back from that and we just maybe assume, and maybe you've not had this issue at all, I think I just maybe have assumed that on day five when God created the Birds, he certainly created the various kinds, but probably only two of each kind. And again, I figure that because he creates, you know, man and woman, just one pair, one man, one woman, and that must apply to the animals that he has created. 
And the other thing that influences me, and we'll, we're, we're heading there, it's going to be a great day when we get there, is the Noahic worldwide flood and Noah's Ark. And one of the things we know about the Ark is it had the capacity to, to, to hold not only everything that God wanted it to hold, but every one. And we'll be emphasizing many things, but I just say to you in passing that there was a lot more room in there than for Noah's 8. But we know by way of the narrative that the animals come two by two, right? And so and some of uh, the good Christian organizations have helped us to come to grips with that. God didn't need to bring 5,000 elephants into the ark. He only needed a single pair. And that's what the text, the narrative communicates to us. They came, pair, they came by pair. They came two by two. So two elephants in the ark, two giraffes in the ark, you got the idea. So again, that's yet another reason why I probably have been mistaken about God's creation of the fish and fowl and, and tomorrow, God's creation of the land animals, that he made many different kinds for an enjoyment, but he probably only made two of each kind. But here's the thing. The wording and terminology in verse 20 absolutely dictates otherwise. When God creates the fish and the birds, he creates not a single pair of each kind. And probably not even hundreds of pairs, but I wouldn't be surprised, and God will straighten this out, a little bit of speculation on our part, and God will nail it down for us when we see him someday soon. I wouldn't be surprised if he's actually creating thousands of pairs of each kind. And you say, well, Pastor Tom, why are you saying that? Well, the key word here is abundantly, and again, sadly, we have tended to read over it. If you look very carefully, and once again, please, it is a little bit more clear in the original language than in our English text, but if you look carefully, you recognize that God brings the fish and fowl into existence abundantly. It's a Hebrew word, sharat, and that particular Hebrew word, this is so exciting. I can tell you're just so excited about this, that Hebrew word sharat, if it was applied to insects, it would be speaking of a swarm. And we have the same word, this is so neat for those of you that take note, and, and please, it'll be worth the trip, although you'll have what you need just from this simple observation. We have the very same word, abundantly, use the very same Hebrew term behind our English word, abundantly, used in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 3, concerning the second plague of the ten plagues that brings Israel out of Israel. Egypt miraculously and powerfully and the term the very same one we have here is used of the plague of the frogs and if you turn to the narrative you'd have God expressing the significance of the term not two frogs hopping around and causing all kinds of mischief But the text says that the river and later the rivers brought forth, and here's our word, abundantly, so much so that the narrative expresses to us that the land of Egypt was covered with frogs, including Pharaoh's palace. Can you imagine that kind of abundance? Oh, and I think I see the purpose behind it, but please note that with me. God is bringing forth life, and he's not just bringing forth life. He's bringing forth life abundantly. It's springing into existence, not just one, not just two, but hundreds, perhaps thousands of each of the kind. And then on top of that, if you've paid attention to the narrative, God says to these hundreds, perhaps thousands of kinds multiply so that ultimately you fill. Talk about life. Talk about multiple life springing into existence at the 
Word of God, day five, God creates the birds, not just all the various kinds, but multiples of each kind. And God creates the fishes, and not just one kind of fish, and not just one pair of one kind, but all the kinds and multiples of each kind. Many, fully grown, fully developed, irreducibly complex creature, cr- creatures Created instantaneously by divine fiat, God said, and they were. Teeming with life. Say, Pastor Tom, I don't get it. Why are you so excited about that? Well, two things, and I leave you with this. One, we once again have been brought back full circle to the power of God's word. And I remind you that it's been inscripturated for you and me, and you're holding it in your hands this morning. And this word saves and sanctifies that kind of power. This book, because it presents the glorious gospel, this book because it first confronts us with our sin and then leads us to the one and only Savior. This book saves lives. This book will absolutely transform your life, make you, guess what, a new living creature. And then following salvation, the book absolutely sanctifies. As we, out of love and appreciation to the one who saved us, actually begin with God's help to order our lives according to the truth of his word. We're brought back full circle to the power of God's word. Not just spoken at the time of creation, but inscripturated. So we have a Biblos. So we have the B-I-B-L-E. And we know what it is. And it saves and sanctifies, but I, I see something else. God, when on day five, he, he creates these living creatures. In this case, it's fish and fowl, and he creates multiples of those. He creates many, many of each kind, and, and, and so we have much more brought into existence than we've ever envisioned, and then he commands those multiples of kinds to multiply and fill the earth. And you walk away from that with the simple realization that God is, is just creating lots and lots of stuff, that he, 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 wants, he wants it all. And, and then I made the blessed transition to his view of men, women, and children, and his desire to save. Not one. Not a single pair. Not hundreds of pairs. Not thousands. God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all, all, all should come to repentance. Watch as he just fills the earth with many things, many living creatures, lots, and see how it beautifully reflects on the heart of God concerning his, the, the pinnacle of his creation. And know again today, this hour, that God desires for every man, woman, and young person to be saved, rescued from the penalty and power of their sin. The fact is, if you and I are here this morning and we're not saved, it's not because God hasn't done everything that he needs to do in order for you to be saved. It's not that he hasn't paved the way because he absolutely has. It's not because it's not his desire. His desire is the exact opposite of that. It is because up until this point in time, you've been living in rebellion to this God who first created you 
And then when we turned our backs on him, he pursued us and did what he needed to do to rescue us out of our rebellion. And he did that by sending the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Christ, through his death, burial, and resurrection, offering to repair our broken relationship with the God who created us. That kind of salvation. A restored relationship with God and rescue from the penalty and condemnation of our sin. You're here this morning or within the sound of this voice and you have not yet trusted Christ. Today's the day of salvation. Please, this is the moment for you to prayerfully trust Christ. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me for just a moment. You're here and the Spirit of God's tugging on your heart. I don't want to leave you hanging. I want to be clear. We rejoice over the simplicity of the gospel. We are sinners. We've, we've broken God's law. We are guilty because of our sin. We are rebels. We've turned our backs on God. We were like sheep that have gone astray. But God, Isaiah 53, laid on the Lord Jesus Christ the iniquity of us all so that we could be saved, delivered, rescued, redeemed. And here's the heart of God. He loves you. And the very first thing he desires to do is save you and make you a part of his family. See, here's the thing, it's most blessed, the Bible makes it clear, when we put our faith and trust in Christ, not only our sins are forgiven, not only our sins forgiven, not only are we the recipients of eternal life, and not only does heaven become our eternal home, but our broken relationship is repaired, and we are saved. I encourage you in the quietness of this moment. You can do so in the quiet recesses of your own heart. Would you call upon the name of the Lord? Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on him? Again, there's nothing mystical or even magical about the words. Would you recognize your sin before a righteous and holy God? And would you pray to receive Christ as your own personal Savior? Receive him today, I plead with you you and as you are doing that please let these final words echo in your heart let somebody know please and if you still have some hurdles if you still have some questions would you come we'd be privileged to sit down with you and share with you more child of God saved can you believe it redeemed can you believe it rescued can you believe it? How then should we live? God, impress these things upon our hearts today, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Though I'm sure we'll visit this song in the days to come, I wanted to close with it today. You know the song, it begins, O Lord my God, when I am awesome wonder, consider all thy the worlds thy hands have made. But something happened, and it was sin. And it picks up, and that's where we're going to sing in verse 3. And when I think that God, his son, not spared. Let's stand together, singing verse 3 of How Great Thou Art. You'll find it in page 2 of your hymnal. Verse 3. And when I Thank you. 
I've asked our dear brother, Gene Robichaud, to please close us in a word of prayer. Mr. Robichaud. Our Heavenly Father, it is truly good to be in your house this day. We thank you for your precious word. We thank you for the study that is underway in the book of Genesis, and we know that God, in ages past, made a plan that we might have a Savior who would come down and die that we might have eternal life. We think, too, of Pastor Briggs today, and we just pray you'll give wisdom to the doctors, and we pray that uh, Pastor Briggs will uh, be recuperating and doing much better. Be with each of us now as we go to our homes, and we'll thank and praise you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.